It's all well and good playing a game with the intent to finish it, and generally speaking, I'll do just that. But once in a while, there will be a game that I will abandon for one reason or another. And by that nature, a fair few on this list are what I consider to be subpar games, but I'll be clear that there are a couple on here that I consider to be decent, and in some cases I have gone back to finish them. But anyway, here are seven JRPGs that I have abandoned. And we'll start with a game that frequent viewers know I hold in utter contempt, because it nearly snuffed out my desire to play games in general for a second lengthy hiatus. Back when I stuck to the principle of playing one game at a time and looked to finish them as well, Agarest Generations of War was the double-layered titanium-coated brick wall that sought to stop the momentum I had. And it did that pretty well. I've always maintained that the only thing I liked about this game was the premise. The idea of living your life between different generations sounded pretty cool at first. But with that design in mind, the game inevitably becomes longer, even even when compared to contemporary, so it needed something to prop it up and keep the experience fresh throughout. And that's where Agarest dropped the ball. The gameplay is some of the most monotonous I've ever experienced. For an SRPG, the amount of repetition you see is mind-numbing. The same tired maps, the same drab enemies again and again. Not to mention, the game does require a fair amount of grinding, which isn't terrible if the game was fun. But it isn't, and it turns the adventure into one mundane slog. I'd rather do a Tough Mudder challenge in full body armour than put myself through this Chinese torture again. And then when you actually progress the story, it feels so unrewarding. Battle upon battle for a few CG cutscenes and voiceover. Add on to that the difficulty spikes where enemies will smack you down in one hit even on easy mode and I was done by 25 hours. I will give Agarest one thing though, it changed my mindset on how I play through JRPGs. That being if a game doesn't grab me within 10 hours, it gets put in the proverbial incinerator and is never played again. So, thanks for that Agarest, but no thanks. Moving on now to a bit of Compile Hearts with Fairy Fencer F. Now even though this game didn't grab me either, I do at least concede I liked it more than Agarest. The opening for one is damn catchy. It's got a solid beat and is unashamedly flashy as befitting a game from this developer. Composer and Final Fantasy alumni Uematsu did a good job in this one to set the tone. And the initial moments were okay, I was on board with the game's overall direction and the gameplay loop of Finding Furies that fed into progression was solid. But as it wore on, I just lost more and more interest until I abandoned it 15 hours in. There was just something I couldn't grasp with Fairy Fencer F. It just felt too clunky for me, not enough that it became outright unplayable, but I noticed it. And then there's the narrative side of the spectrum, where even though I think the pacing is decent and the premise is good, it's hampered by the tone of the writing that refuses to take any situation seriously. I get it, that happens in a fair amount of Compile Heart titles, most notably Neptunia, but this isn't Neptunia, this is Fairy Fencer. If you're going for a serious vibe, at least follow through in the writing. Now I do realise there is an enhanced remake master of this game called Advent Dark Force, which apparently added and fixed a lot of issues from the original, so maybe that will alleviate a few of the problems I had the first time around, but to be honest I have no intention of picking it up again anytime soon. However, one game that I do want to pick up again is Tales of Zillia. Put away your pitchforks, there are what I consider to be a few decent games on this list, and Tales of Zillia is one of them. If this game got a remaster or a port to a modern console, I'd pick it up immediately. My reasoning for not finishing this one all comes down to real-life commitments at that point in time. I was just starting my masters at this point, but believing I would attain the odd bit of downtime here and there, I asked my mate if I could borrow his PS3 since he had just purchased a PS4 after getting a job of his own. Enamoured with his new toy, he was happy to lend me the PS4 free for a month along with Tales of Zillia which had taken my attention in the past. And sure enough, while I was getting settled into my new life before the semester started, I found plenty of time to play and I was having a good time. I thought the combat was decent with new additions like linking, I liked the characters, especially Jude and Mila, and I thought the dual narrative was a good idea, but I never had the chance to see how it fully played out, so the judgement's out on that. When the semester started though, I was spending pretty much all my time at university, starting at 8 in the morning, returning at around 9 in the evening, and thus having no time for myself, especially early on. And what that meant is that leisurely activities like playing games were pushed to the side. Before I knew it, the month was up and I gave the console and game back to my mate and that is it for my experience with Tales of Zillia, a game that I was enjoying but real life got in the way. And personally, I can't justify buying a PS3 for just one game. And since we're going over games that I am positive about, I think it's worth putting the other one here right now, in Trails in the Sky First Chapter. What? You're a Trails fan and you never finished Sky First Chapter? Well, I have now, but when I first tried it, I actually dropped the game. And that was once again partially due to real-life circumstances, having just finished my undergraduate degree and scouring around to find employment. However, though I did have more free moments as compared to my time doing my Masters, Sky First Chapter in the early stages didn't grab me. There was nothing there in the opening moments that demanded my time or attention, and thus I left. 
left it. Come 2018 though, I discovered Trails of Cold Steel, loved it, dug a bit deeper into the rabbit hole, and sure enough went back to Sky First Chapter to see how this long-reaching narrative begun. And yes, I adored it as I do pretty much all of the Trails games, but if it weren't for Trails of Cold Steel, there's a good chance that not only would I have never gone back to Sky First Chapter, but this channel wouldn't exist either. Now on to an ambitious project by the Saga team in 2008's Last Remnant. This was sort of a testing of the waters phase for Square as they incorporated a third party engine, namely Unreal Engine 3, to make the Last Remnant a reality. And what we got was, well, this. Like Fairy Fencer F, my main issue with the Last Remnant at first was due to technical issues. I got it on Xbox 360 when it first released and it wasn't pretty, the actual performance of the game wasn't optimal to say the least. It wasn't just that though, the actual protagonist in Rush Sykes was also a letdown for me. Just didn't do anything that made him feel relatable. Bland design, stilted dialogue, you name it, he's a highlight for all the wrong reasons. And that's a shame because from what I remember, The Last Remnant had a really cool battle system. Instead of issuing direct input, you take on the role of a pseudo-commander, giving contextual based commands that the squads act out, and over time those units will gradually improve with their own skills. What I really like though is that the outcome of battle is largely dependent on morale, which in of itself places heavy importance on how you position your squads. Flanking and surrounding units can have a notable impact on this element, which, like in real life, reflects the flow of eventual combat outcomes. Those with strong morale are more likely to wipe the opposing units out. It felt like mini total war at times, and it was executed quite well. Unfortunately, that alone wasn't enough to keep me engaged. For me, great gameplay is not an equal counterbalance for a bland narrative, cookie-cutter characters, and technical issues galore. To its credit though, Last Remnant does have a remaster on PS4, utilising Unreal Engine 4, which apparently followed on from the fixes introduced in the now-absent PC version. But again, no desire to go back anytime soon. Okay, so we did one Square title, now let's go over another one, and it's Final Fantasy XIII Lightning Returns. I've mentioned before that I'm not overly fond about the first title in the trilogy. I abandoned it initially, went back a few years later to get a second perspective, and the issues I had with it the second time round were exactly the same. However, one thing I did like about the saga was the story, an epic tale spanning three games that was ultimately due to be concluded in Lightning Returns. And even though I didn't play XIII 2, I did check out one of those cinematic videos on YouTube to see how the story connected to this final chapter. So I bit the bullet. I wanted to see how it all concluded and I bought this game for my Xbox 360 and plugged that baby in. And it gets off to a good start. Lightning is tasked by Bunavelza, the god of light, to ease the souls of the world's inhabitants so that it can be ready for the trip to a new world as the current one is due to end in 13 days. Branded as the savior, she descends to the lands below the Ark, initially starting with a countdown of six days, but releasing the burden of souls through quests will extend the time that Lightning has to fulfill her duty. Now, while I liked the direction that Lightning Returns went down, it all came down the one thing that sapped my enjoyment away from the title, as it felt you had to play Lightning Returns the right way, and it's the time limit. Though it is admittedly lenient to the player giving plenty of time to do what needs to be done, I just can't stand having a giant clock ticking over my head while I explore what are fairly large zones. You don't get much in the way of direction either, you've got main quests that have to be completed lest you fail the adventure outright, but I found I was lost more often than not. Then combine that with the battle system. In this game you're only controlling Lightning and Paradox times are put aside for schemata, outfits that Lightning can wear that also give her unique abilities and weapons. Enemies have elemental weaknesses like before, but you have to also contend with finding a balance of schemata that works to each situation. For example, blocking at the right time, switching when the ATB gauge is depleted, and staggering the enemy like in previous iterations. It takes a bit of time to get used to, but it feels like time you just don't have. Every death I experienced felt like one more chrono-infused block on top of my head that was leading to the inevitable outcome. I restarted the game twice, and on my final run used a walkthrough to help out. Even then, I just didn't grasp what the game wanted from me. And since that point, the game has been gaining dust ever since. But I did watch how the story unfolded, and that was pretty cool. However, this last entry isn't cool. If I had to choose one game to never recommend to anyone, it would be Star Ocean Integrity and Faithlessness. Because I tell you, this game pretty much made me lose all faith within a 10 hour period. This just feels like a collection of decisions made by the Muppets and put into game form. When I picked up Integrity and Faithlessness, my only experience with Star Ocean was The Last Hope, which I liked a lot. And I'm confident that even if I played it again now, I'd still like it. Even with its flaws and certain characters that will remain unnamed, okay. It was a fun experience with a great sense of scale as you traverse the cosmos. But to many, Last Hope is considered the bottom of the barrel for the series, and that disdain seemed to translate to this newest entry too. So, if that logic held, then maybe I would like this one as well. Yeah, that 
didn't happen. I get it, this was a game on a budget, but Tri-Ace once again did something that they are often known for, and that is biting off more than they can chew. Let's start with the first big issue I had. I'm not joking here, Integrity and Faithlessness is the only game I have played that has made me physically sick. The camera is undoubtedly the worst I have ever experienced in a JRPG. On the overworld, it's far too close, and it jitters all over the place when you're traversing terrain. Sure, there are fixes that alleviate the issue somewhat, like lowering the sensitivity and zooming out, but it's still bad. In combat, it's not much better. It switches lock-on between enemies faster than a Rottweiler chasing steak on a merry-go-round. It's also ridiculously low. Why? Was this filmed by an ant? Did Lakitu lose his cloud? Whoever QA tested this must have had a brown envelope in their locker as they left. I refuse to believe they thought this was okay. And then there's the cutscenes, or should I say lack of. Most of the story is told in real time. Characters stand around and dialogue is given. The voice acting isn't too bad, but the actual cinematic direction is non-existent. For example, the opening moments. You train, you get attacked by bandits that the game briefly panned over not one minute before, you kill them and you make your way to the capital all without a cutscene to be witnessed. It's jarring, and the story beats have no impact as a result. Why would I care about any of these people when I literally have no reason to feel attached to them? The main characters aren't too much better, they're as generic as they come, with wooden dialogue to match, and models made out of Play-Doh, even more so than Last Hope. As for the journey itself, well, I didn't complete it, but I hear it's short. Even considering that, though, there was clear asset reuse even down to the soundtrack, and there was so much backtracking even in the eight hours I played it for. And even though I think the combat has some elements of fun as Star Ocean generally does, the package overall commits the one cardinal sin that any game just cannot do. It's boring. An absolute slog to play through. I dare say people in prison are forced to play this till they go insane. At least then it would have a use. There are just no redeeming factors in integrity and faithlessness. It's a bad game in its most primal form. It's got a bland story and characters, asset reuse, backtracking aplenty, terrible narrative presentation, and it also has the potential of making you chuck up your Sunday dinner. No thanks, never again. And there it is guys, 7 JRPGs that I abandoned. Please give this a like and subscribe if you want more JRPG goodness, and consider joining my Patreon if you're able. Peace!